This episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the problem was final, the house was empty, and his bow was last, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Why would the Pope engage Sherlock Holmes' services? Why did he receive the Legion of Honor from France? And why would he refuse a knighthood? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 245. How do you solve a problem like Maria? Well, hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look at the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, that is an eternally damning question. How do you solve a problem like Maria? Well, first you need an orchestra, <laughs> a mountain, and a terrifically talented blonde singer. Uh, we are absent all of those, unfortunately. Okay. So, well, what we do have is a place for you to go and check the show notes for this episode. It's ihose.co slash trifles245. That'll take you to sherlockholmespodcast.com to the specific episode in question here. We will have links for you there if uh, we discuss any during the show. And, of course, there are ways to leave us feedback, whether it's a comment about the show. You can leave it right there below the show notes, or you can email us at trifles at ihearofsherlock.com. And all of our social handles are there as well. We are at I Hear of Sherlock on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, wherever it makes sense for you to engage with us, we are there. Well, I was um, a little cryptic with the title here, How Do You Solve a Problem Like Maria? I think it'll become uh, imminently clear when we mention to people the story in question is Thor Bridge. Thor Bridge. That's, that's, that's what you go to, th- to have handled when you go to see a dentist. <laughs> and your dentures are uh, in difficult. No, we're talking about the problem of, for, of Thor Bridge, which appeared in, I think it was the casebook of Sherlock Holmes, that final collection of stories. And what we want to do here is a little different than what we typically do. Uh, we want to work backwards. Uh, and, and Holmes himself uh, warns us that he has gotten into uh, a bad habit like that as well. Um, he and Watson are talking in, uh, in the flat at Baker Street, and uh, he says, I-, I forgot I had not told you. I'm getting into your involved habit, Watson, of telling a story backward. You had best read this first. So just a quick warning. If you have not read The Problem of Thor Bridge yet, you might want to do that before you listen to this episode because, spoiler alert, ahead. So we find ourselves in Baker Street and... Sherlock Holmes is being visited by Neil Gibson, J. Neil Gibson, a former U.S. senator known as the Gold King. And his wife is dead. And what it looks like to uh, everyone involved is uh, a murder. There is a governess involved, a young governess uh, to whom Mr. Gibson is attracted and a revolver is found in her dresser. And it's the same kind of revolver that uh, could ostensibly have killed Maria Gibson, Mr. Gibson's wife. And so immediately it becomes the case that uh, Holmes is trying to figure out whether Miss Grace Dunbar, the governess, has in fact killed her rival, 
is the classic love triangle uh, that we're presented with. And it, it to, to most casual observers, it would seem uh, pretty much an open and shut case, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. And that, you know, even before we get into the mechanics of the case, gives rise to some interesting observations and speculation one could make before anything happens at all. First of all, you mentioned this. Holmes' remark to Watson, I'm getting into your involved habit, Watson, of telling a story backward. Well, now, wait a minute. <laughs> Watson doesn't. Let's find an example <laughs> where Watson does that. Uh, you know, Okay, but passing, passing over that, um, Holmes says to Watson, you know, uh, first of all, they have this little conversation, which is just wonderful in Thorbridge, where you find out about a great number of these wonderful unreported cases. And then you have a little deduction about the cook in Baker Street and the hard-boiled eggs. And then you learn, by the way, that it takes them 15 minutes to have breakfast because a quarter of an hour later, the table's been cleared, and now Holmes is ready to talk business. And um, Watson says, oh, yeah, yeah, I know the name, Neil Gibson. And Holmes waves his hand. He said, well, I had no idea the case was coming my way, or I should have had my extracts ready. The fact is that the problem, though exceedingly sensational, appeared to present no difficulty. You know, the fact that this fellow is really interesting doesn't obscure the clearness of the evidence. And that was the view taken by the coroner's jury in the police court proceedings. And it's now going to the assizes at Winchester. Well, wait a second now. <laughs> so Holmes is apparently taking at face value everything he's read, what little he's read in the paper and says, I fear it's a thankless business. I can discover facts, Watson, but I can't change them. Well, and then, of course, he gets to the real nub of it, unless some entirely new and unexpected ones come to light, which is exactly what happens. I don't see what my client uh, can hope for. And Watson says, client. And then we get to the note from Neil Gibson from Claridge's, which is in itself really extraordinary. Yeah. And I mean, you talk about burying the lead. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Here Holmes has an ex another extremely wealthy client. Right? We talked about how Holmes uh, had the Duke of Holderness as a client, extracted a check for 12,000 pounds, you know, even though he was, quote unquote, a poor man. Um, Up until then, he was a poor yeah, man. Well, there you go. There you go. Um so here, here is another high-profile, very wealthy client. And Holmes says, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, by the way, I have this client that's related to this case I've just been talking about. Yeah. Now, the lovely thing when you get, get to the letter is that it just bursts through with the voice of this very American, almost a little lampoony American, <laughs> you know, dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I mean, he just... You might as well forget the dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes. He just couldn't wait. I can't see the best woman God ever made go to her death without doing all that's possible to save her. You know, and I can't explain it, but I know beyond all doubt she's innocent. Uh, you know the facts. It's been the gossip of the country. Nobody's raised a voice in her defense. The injustice of it makes me crazy. The woman has a heart. Wouldn't let her kill a fly. Okay, well, I'll come tomorrow at 11 and see if you can get some ray of light in the dark. And maybe I've got some clue and maybe I don't know. Anyway, everything I have is for your use if you could only save her. If you ever in your life showed your powers, put them now into this case. Mm. Dictated, but not read, Daniel Gibson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very, very much so. And it is it is kind of a lampoon of uh, the American tycoon. Yeah. Um, well, uh, long story short, Holmes takes the case, uh, ends up figuring out, based on a few uh, clues, very few clues, including the chip on the underside of the parapet of Thor Bridge, where Mrs. Gibson was found. Uh, and uh, fished out a revolver matching the one found in Miss Grace Dunbar's dresser uh, or wardrobe uh, and determined that Maria Gibson uh, was uh, not a victim of murder, but instead uh, committed suicide in a vindictive uh, last move against her husband and her lover, uh, his lover, rather. Well, that would be a love triangle, um, and 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 so 
what what we're left with as Holmes solves this, and ostensibly this this tycoon and his uh, governess go off and and live happily ever after, is I think uh, another lampoon of 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 the wronged woman hell bent on revenge. And I think there was a lot more to the personality of Maria Gibson, nay Pinto, uh, from Brazil, uh, that is worth exploring. And so we shall do that directly after this quick word. The Baker Street Journal continues to be the leading Sherlockian publication since its founding in 1946 by Edgar W. Smith. In its pages, you'll find both serious scholarship and articles that play the game. The journal is essential reading for anyone interested in Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and a world where it's always 1895. If you subscribe to the Baker Street Journal, you'll get four quarterly issues as well as the Christmas Annual. You don't have to be a member of the BSI or of any Sherlockian society, for that matter, to subscribe to the journal. It's open to anyone who enjoys talking about, reading about, and writing about Sherlock Holmes. And you can also contribute to the BSJ. Your imagination is the only limitation there. So get on the bandwagon and subscribe to the Baker Street Journal this year. Make it an important part of your commitment to the world of Sherlock Holmes. Just go to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and subscribe today. All right, we are back. And here's what we know about Maria Gibson early on. Holmes uh, read that that uh, letter from Neil Gibson. says, there you have it. Uh, that is the gentleman I await. Um, this, uh, this man is the greatest financial power in the world and a man, I understand, of most violent and formidable character. He married a wife, the victim of this uh, tragedy, of whom I know nothing, save that she was past her prime, <laughs> which was the more unfortunate as a very attractive governess superintended the education of the two young children. So, so right there, Holmes, uh, all he says is he knows he's, he's got an aged wife, matched with an aged wife. I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race. <laughs> but, What's what's interesting here is we are visited um, directly thereafter by uh, Mr. Marlowe Bates, who was the superintendent, the manager of the estate of the uh, the Gibson estate. Uh, he was about to give his two weeks notice, and uh, he says, um, "In a couple of weeks, I'll sh- I'll have shaken off this accursed slavery, a hard man." Mr. Holmes, to all about him. Uh, those public charities are a screen to cover his private iniquities. But his wife was his chief victim. He was brutal to her. Yes, sir, brutal. How she came by her death, I do not know, but I'm sure that he had made her life a misery to her. She was a creature of the tropics, Brazilian by birth, a tropical by birth, tropical by nature, a child of the sun and of passion. She had loved him as such women can love, but when her own physical charms had faded, I am told that they were once great. There was nothing to hold him. We all liked her and felt for her and hated him for the way that he treated her. But he's plausible and cunning. So, that's um, that's a pretty astounding uh, view there, an inside view, well, with perhaps a man who had a uh, an axe to grind. Um, but uh, it 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 helps us understand that uh, this perhaps was a two way street, and Gibson himself uh, said that uh, he he met Maria Pinto when he was gold hunting in uh, Brazil. Uh, she was the daughter of a government official at Manaus, and she was very beautiful. Uh, he says, I was young and more ardent in those days, but even now I look back 
with colder blood and a more critical eye. And I can see she was a rare, she was rare and wonderful in her beauty. It was a deep, rich nature too, passionate, wholehearted, tropical, ill-balanced, very different from the American women whom I had known. Well, to make a long story short, I loved her and married her. It was only when the romance had passed, and it lingered for years, that I realized that we had nothing, absolutely nothing, in common. My love faded. If hers had faded also, it might have been easier. But you know how wonderful the way of many women. Do what I might, nothing could turn her from me. If I have been harsh to her, even brutal, as some have said, it may have been because I knew that it would kill her love. Or if it turned to hate, it would be easier for both of us. But nothing changed her. She adored me in those English woods as she had adored me 20 years ago on the banks of the Amazon. Do what I might, she was as devoted as ever. I mean, what a, what a remarkable love story. I mean, twisted as it is, but I mean, to think of the devotion that she had to him. And he was simply hell-bent on trying to snuff it out in any way he could. Well, that's what we're told, you know, but there are um, other interpretations of events, you know, that could be made here. But but to your point, yes, I mean, we have built up at this point before Holmes even gets on the scene, um, you know, a, a, a picture of these particular personalities and how they've interacted with each other. And the somewhat surprising appearance of Mr. Marlowe Bates. Now, after all, he is the estate manager. He's not the secretary. There's another secretary named Ferguson. But he pops up. So somewhere along the line, he's determined, since Gibson wrote this letter yesterday, that Gibson is on his way to see Sherlock Holmes. So Marlowe Bates must know who Sherlock Holmes is. Indeed, everyone must know who Sherlock Holmes is. And Bates, who's going to be resigning his position anyway, because of his great affection and love for Maria Pinto. We all loved her and hated him for his brutal treatment. He decides that he's going to run down ahead of Gibson and give Sherlock Holmes the straight story here, um, you know, which is, I think, considering the cases of the canon, something that I don't think is repeated anywhere in another adventure of Sherlock Holmes, that information comes to Holmes before he even meets the first, uh, well, I guess you could say speckled band probably because, um, you know, Miss Stoner does, of course, tell him about Grimsby Royal and then Royal it shows up. But in this case, Gibson is the client. And here is somebody popping up saying, uh, you know, this guy's a beast, basically. Yeah. And I mean, look, Gibson himself admitted being a bit of a beast too. And, and mm. if, if he does indeed try uh, at, at, at his hardest to get his wife to cease to love him, um, would taking a mistress eventually do that enough to drive her to suicide? Um, you know, let, let's take this from a, from another perspective because it, look, it, it sounds like Maria Gibson was was completely immovable in terms of her love for her husband. Um, but but let's let's look at it this way: What if she actually did not commit suicide? What if it actually was a murder, and it was it was made? to look like a suicide eventually for Sherlock Holmes to come in and rule it a suicide. I mean, Gibson could have set it up himself just as easily uh, to match the facts that Holmes eventually deduced. You know, they, they, they could very well have murdered uh, Maria Gibson, ridding themselves of this immovable problem. This, this woman who would not cease to love him and in those days would not grant him a divorce well, what's the next best way to get her out of the way? Well, murder uh, disguised as suicide. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of this from the from the perspective of Maria Gibson and and what she might think in in all of her ardor and all of her passion. Would passion be enough to actually drive her to suicide? 
Well, the only things that we know about Maria Gibson come from Neil Gibson himself and from Marlo Bates. Um, it could well be, you know, the alternative explanation here about the murder of Maria Pinto is that this was a plan between Gibson and Grace Dunbar. And it could be that Maria Pinto, you know, was the sweetest, happiest, most content. It could be that um, in their marriage or in the organization of Neil Gibson's fortune, she had ownership over a particular large percentage of it in some fashion. Could be that some of his gold mines were in her native country. Could be a variety of things. Yeah. So then if you've got Maria Pinto who needs to be gotten out of the way and you're in a house with um, a set of pistols, two identical, you know, you could say to yourself, I wonder if we could stage this as a suicide. Listen, Grace, here's what, here's what you need to do. You need to go to Maria and say, my God, I've gotten this note from Neil and he wants to meet me down by the bridge. And I just find him so repulsive. I can't bear to be in his company. Could you take care of this for me? And Maria says, sure, I will. So Maria goes down to the bridge. And then Neil has one of these pistols and sneaks up behind her and blows her brains out. And then they take that particular pistol, tie a string and a rock to it, throw it into the waterworks. And everything then proceeds and they are confident that with his superior abilities, Sherlock Holmes will note the chip on the stonework while everyone else is not. And that, in fact, is why things become so urgent. You know, it would have been one thing if the initial investigation had turned all that up. But now the case is going to the assizes. So now they have to reach out to Sherlock Holmes. So they put Bates up to run into Baker Street with this particular story. Gibson supports it. Holmes goes out there and uh, makes his set of deductions, clearing Grace Dunbar. That that seems to match all the facts of the case. It's one way of uh, of looking at it. Well, I guess um, yes, but, but but the fundamental flaw of that argument is that. Um, Neil Gibson and Grace Dunbar would have to be smart enough to fool Sherlock Holmes. And I don't think that's the case at all. I think that um, even if that is a different and accurate analysis of what really happened to Maria Pinto, I think Sherlock Holmes was smart enough to see exactly what's going on. And that's why when he was doing his investigation, he discovered that Grace Dunbar was really Fingers Dunbar, the, <laughs> the, the prominent pickpocket who'd recently been released from Wormwood Scrubs and decided that they deserved each other and that that was really the best fate that could befall crazy old Neil Gibson, who so, was to wind up with, uh, with a convicted uh, criminal. <laughs> so are you saying if you want to separate... A gold digger from a gold king, all it takes is grace. <laughs> and that is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. I've broken stronger men than you, Mr. Holmes. Nobody crosses me and gets the better of it. So many have said so, yet here I am. <laughs>